Such a beautiful picture up here this morning on the platform, as always, when led in worship. So grateful for this crew and the time that they put in uh, into leading us and the heart in which they do it. So grateful for them. A couple of things before I get started this morning, lest I forget, because I know I will forget. That's just who I am. Uh, first of all, a group of your men joined us this week at our big evangelism conference, our team at the Arkansas Baptist State Convention puts this on once a year. And uh, some guys from the church drove up two hours or so and hung out with us to hear Dr. Tony Evans preach. And uh, it was a tremendous time together. Glad to see them. Uh, one thing that Nelson and I were talking about before church began is that uh, there was a lot of interaction when Dr. Evans preached uh, this last week. And so uh, there was one guy in particular and he would just yell out, glory, glory, glory. And so I know John Moore this morning, I know during the middle of the message is going to just let it rip one way or the other. I just, I, I feel it in my heart that it's going to happen. So uh, no, tremendous time. Trem I hear you laughing. Tremendous time. Uh, and the other thing is I was given before service a wedding set, a ring uh, and a band that was found, I believe, in a restroom, if I remember that correctly. Yeah, and so uh, Melissa has that up here. If you're missing that, uh, she has that under safe, safe and secure. Well, she was asking me for addresses of pawn shops for some reason when I was walking up here, but, but she does have that, so if you want to come up and grab that. Uh, if not, if someone, if you hear word, Miss Lynette will have that in the office uh, this week, okay? All right, so... Uh, just wondering this morning, uh, if you come, uh, come in with a question uh, towards a particular circumstance in your life where you're thinking, man, how do I make this better? How do I make this better? Maybe you're carrying a particular burden. You've come in here today and you're suffering some loneliness and you're wondering, how do I make this better? You've come in with some suffering of some sort. You've come in here uh, even experiencing death of some sort in uh, this last week or even these last few months, I've had so many conversations with folks in this community and this church that have lost uh, deeply over these last few months. And maybe you come in and you think, Man, how do I make this better? We would like to know that there's a light at the end of the tunnel and that we have hope because let's face it, no one wants to be lonely, right? If you're facing loneliness, uh, you, you know what that feels like when you move into a new town or even found a new church and you hope to find some new friends or people that you can count on. There's a hope there that you will build some relationships and it's that hope that kind of moves you forward. Or if you're walking through suffering even right now, you, you're in a crisis and somehow you would like to gain control over whatever that suffering may be right now. And what we do is hope causes us to endure and put one foot in front of the other and just keep walking through whatever that mess is or, or that, that death that I mentioned a second ago. It seems so final, but we sang it in a couple of these songs this morning like, like there's no way that we can change death, but, but, but somehow Jesus has conquered death and we know we've heard that truth, uh, but, but boy, we really would like to dig into that this morning and see death broken. And I think we're going to, as we look at Hebrews chapter 2, if you would turn to Hebrews chapter 2 with me this morning, and uh, we're going to look at the humanity of Jesus when we see Jesus. And I, I hope that your simple prayer as we walk through this passage together, God, help me to see Jesus, because I guarantee you, if we will see Jesus in all of these circumstances, we will leave here with a greater hope. And so you can write down a sermon title this morning, if you would, but we do see Jesus. And as you're turning to Hebrews, and if you're new to the church, new to the faith, exploring the faith, so grateful for you this morning. Hebrews is in the New Testament on the right-hand side of your Bible. You'll remember that last week we started walking through the first part of Hebrews 2, and we talked about that passage that says, don't neglect this great salvation. And I've heard a lot of feedback, even been praying for some specific people in this church uh, this week as they were going to take that message and, and do some things with it. Don't neglect the great salvation that he has given us. This generation depends on us doing something with that message. In this post-Christian society that we live in, we do have an answer for man's greatest need. The truth, though, emerging from Hebrews as we walk through this is that Jesus is superior. 
He is better than, he is greater than the angels, the prophets, the religious figures. He's also highly relatable. And that's where the author kind of goes this morning. As he leaves that message of great salvation, he begins to walk us through Jesus' humanity. And if we'll take a second this morning and consider that Jesus was human, was in the midst of our suffering, did walk through loneliness and even death, we can see Jesus and it gives us great hope. So verse 9 is going to be our platform this morning. We're going to jump off of this particular scripture and I'll read it for you. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. But we do see Jesus made lower than the angels for a short time, so that by God's grace he might taste death for everyone, crowned with glory and honor, because he suffered death. So Jesus became man, lower than the angels, so that he could taste death, and now he's crowned because he suffered throughout Chapter 2, Jesus' humanity, it calls us to relate to him. It actually calls us to see God in a different light, approachable, relatable. So if you are taking notes this morning, just write down this first simple phrase. We're going to bounce around chapter 2 a little bit, but see Jesus as family. Coming in here today, even in the midst of some of your loneliness, we can see Jesus as family because look, at verse 10, look at verse 11, look at verse 12, look at verse 13, look at verse 17. You're going to find a common theme. Man, family terms all over those particular verses. The scripture uses uh, sons and daughters, brothers and sisters, children God gave. One verse says all have one source, pointing back to the father, all have one source. Father, the writer is emphasizing the fact that Jesus is family. Oh, that we would see him as family in this place. We would begin to understand a few things. Number one, we begin to understand this. The God of glory is not ashamed to call you family. Soak on that for just a second. Verse 11, he redeemed you. He loves you. He will bring you to glory. Your earthly family may fail, and many of us have walked through that. But the eternal brother will not. Do you have a, a family, do you have a crazy family member? <laughs> Somebody just said, mm-hmm. A crazy family. I, I, I don't know that I have anyone that's crazy, but there are some that I, I sometimes struggle being around for various reasons. I've got an Uncle Joe. Uncle Joe worked in the oil fields for a long, long time around heavy machinery, and he served in uh, the Korean War on a, a naval vessel uh, as ships were flying in and out. And so his hearing is greatly diminished, but he will not do anything about it. He won't go get a hearing aid. He, he won't figure out how, he's just socially, he doesn't care. So we will be in the middle of a hospital. I can remember when my mom was in ICU and Uncle Joe would be standing outside her door in ICU, yelling at the top of his lungs, is she clothed? Can I go in and see her? And he wants you to respond by yelling. If you don't, if you're just kind of talking in a normal voice, it's not good enough. He wants you to yell and you kind of shy away from that. And you're like, man, I just want to, let's go to another room. Let's get out of here. Kind of a, a shame type of deal. The scripture says here that Jesus is not ashamed to call you brother and sister. Maybe you're a preteen whose dad likes to roll you up into school with the windows down playing some Backstreet Boys. That causes great shame in your life. Jesus is not ashamed of you. Maybe you had that little brother or sister uh, that would always want to hang out with you and your friend group and you were trying to get away. Jesus is not ashamed of you. We walk in here and we know a lot of our mess and we know a lot of what we've done and we think that we cannot approach. Jesus' humanity says, your family, come in. I want to meet with you today. The second thing that we see from Jesus' family is that we receive special insight. Verse 11, did you see it? We are sanctified. We are set apart. A, a special insight here because the family knows. We, we have been blessed by God, given insight into who he is, what he's doing. 
And we are growing in our faith. We are being sanctified. We are being set apart. There's a knowledge that comes as we pursue and follow God. It's a special insight. My wife and kids, they know our family has core values. We don't have banners up around our house like you'll see at the school. We, we don't have mission statements per se. But we just know as we walk through life together, we have these common core values that we will not let go of. That they have special insight to the mission that we are on, a unique insight. So when we see Jesus as family, we begin to grasp the work of the Father. Do you see Jesus today? When he says that we can see him as family, number three, Family stands together, verse 13 and verse 14. Jesus was here with God's children. He shared in flesh and blood. He stood here with us. He stood in our shoes. He stood in our place. He knows us full well. He knows our experiences full well. We're going to circle back around to that here in just a second. But no family stands together. Number four, Jesus identified with us so that we can identify with him. Let's break out of our loneliness today. We have somebody that we can identify with, and he knows what we are going through. Verse 17, he is like us in every way. Well, what does that mean? Jesus experienced poverty. If you think about it, he was born in a foreign place to parents who couldn't afford a lamb for sacrifice. He preached from borrowed boats. He rode on a borrowed donkey into town. He died and was laid in a borrowed tomb. He knew the experience of poverty. Jesus identifies with that. He, he knows weariness. He went away from the crowds so that he could rest. He knows betrayal. Many turned away, walked away from him when his teachings became just a little bit too hard. Even one of his own disciples betrayed him in the end. He knows that experience. Jesus knows temptation when Jesus visited him in the wilderness, when Satan visited him in the wilderness. He knows what it means to be forsaken alone at the cross. He knows grief at the tomb of Lazarus. Are you beginning to see the humanity of Jesus and how he invites us in to identify with us, but not to leave us there in that condition? Not just to identify with us, but to change the condition that we are in. He came to save us as family. If you're, uh, if you're the older sibling in the room, you're the oldest of, of your brothers and sisters, you know what it means to take on responsibilities and challenges. I remember us as young parents, Tyler, having certain expectations for him, certain rules for him. We had certain parameters for him. And then the next one comes along, and maybe that changes a little bit. And then the next one comes along, Elise, bless her heart, she she, it's a free-for-all for her because you just get to that point, right? If you know you're the oldest, you know what it means to make a way, to be the one that kind of launches out and, and navigates those for those, for, uh, life for those that are coming behind. Jesus' work was to be the second Adam. The first Adam came, and the first Adam messed everything up. Jesus came as the Lord God, second Adam, to recapture the family's lost inheritance. He came to recapture, to recover our unity. He became that sacrifice so that we could know God. And he invites us in, see Jesus today as family. The second thing that you can write down today is we need to see Jesus in suffering. See Jesus in our suffering. Verse 9, verse 10, verse 14, verse 18, 18 yeah. Verse 9, Jesus suffered death. Verse 10, he was made perfect as he went through earthly sufferings, yet he remained perfectly obedient. Verse 14, through death he destroyed the power of death, that suffering. Verse 18, Jesus was tempted but never failed, although he experienced the suffering. See, oh, that we would see Jesus in suffering. That our, our concept of suffering would even change this morning if we could grab hold of our Savior in the midst of it. Have you ever noticed that in a hero movie, the hero always suffers before conquering? If you think about John Wayne and Big Jake, come on now, Big Jake, TBS all the time, right? 
before he rescues his grandson, what he suffers, right? A gunshot. I mean, the villain kills his dog, which was named Dog. That's a great name. He walked through this suffering in all the Marvel movies, suffering for the heroes before they conquer. In Apollo 13, that movie, before returning to earth safely, suffering before victory. No, no movie has a hero that is just heroic all the way through, untouched, comfortable. What, what kind of movie would that be if the hero didn't have to go through something? Victory doesn't just come, it's won. When we look at Jesus and his suffering, we know that he came to win us the victory over everything that we were coming, going, that we're going through. Look at verse 14. He's flesh and blood. Man, let's just sit there for a second this morning. Blood coursed through his veins. He had physical, bodily organs. Chemical reactions were happening in the brain of Jesus. Connective tissues. He knew what it was like to be tired and hungry. He knew mental anguish when tempted. He knew mental anguish of trying to follow through with God's will when he went to the garden. See the humanity of Jesus and the suffering and the torture and the death on the cross. It didn't just come. It was one when he fulfilled his purpose. So that means something for you and I today as we think about suffering. In 1 Peter 4.12, it tells us that suffering causes us to rejoice because a greater glory is coming. Suffering points us to a greater glory. In Romans 8.28, it says that we, we walk through suffering and all those things work together for our good. God uses pain for a purpose. In 1 Peter 1, 6 and 7, it says that we, uh, we suffer and the genuineness of our faith rises up, rises to the top. It proves the genuineness of our faith as we walk through those things. Philippians 3.10 says that when we suffer, we will know him and the power of his resurrection. There, there's a there's a reason for this, and we need to see Jesus in our suffering. So when we look to Jesus, we, we, we see someone who knows. Man, I'm weak and frail in this thing. I, 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 it's often in suffering when I will make my worst decisions. Does anybody relate with that? It, just when things kind of are crushing in is when I'm most unwise. Jesus knows that. It's often in my suffering, when I'm walking through a tough situation, that I may question God. It's often in the suffering when I kind of lose control of my attitude. I'll lash out. Or I will even shrivel up and just try to get away from people. Jesus understands that. That's what the scripture is trying to say to us today. If we will see the humanity of Jesus, we know we have someone who knows, he understands. The humanity of Jesus understands us. The sacrifice of Jesus covers us. The resurrected Jesus offers us hope in the midst of it. I always try to give you guys the gospel in the midst of the sermon somewhere. And I want us to think about this in suffering in particular. In free will, we broke our bodies. God gave us this free will. He didn't just command and control our love. He gave us the opportunity to love and to worship him. When we didn't, when we rebelled, we broke our bodies down to our very core. We broke ourselves. We broke the atmosphere. We broke creation. We broke everything. That's what sin does. It's an infestation. Our sin affects everything. So now we deal with this pain and this suffering and death. But thankfully, in the midst of that brokenness, Jesus came and he walked in humanity to redeem us and to offer us help. In his redemption, we have this opportunity now for a new world. 
in his redemption, we have opportunity for a new creation. Because he's the king of kings and lord of lords, in his redemption, we can step out of this suffering and into a new body in the resurrection. That is the great hope and help that Jesus has come to give us. And so even though death is inevitable, suffering unavoidable, those who follow Jesus have a resurrection awaiting them. It's who he is. And so this morning, as we think about walking through suffering, we can grab hold of anticipation. Mitch talked about this a little bit at the beginning of the service. Or Nelson, Nelson talked about it. Anticipation. Do you remember uh, the anticipation of new birth, maybe having your own child, a grandchild, uh, having a niece or a nephew or, or a friend even, having a baby, that, that anticipation as, as you're hoping and as you're waiting for this new life to come and to, to take shape, that's, that's who we are today. That, that's what we get to experience even in the midst of suffering in hope there's an anticipation of something better that's going to happen because of a Jesus who rose from the grave. And that leads us to the last point. See Jesus in death. That we would see Jesus in death this morning. Verse 9, verse 14, verse 15, it's, it's clear Jesus experienced death. And by doing so, he destroyed it. Death destroyed by death. Death didn't keep Jesus down. He rose again with the power over death, which means this for us today. It even says it here in the scriptures towards the end of this passage. We can be free from the fear of death. We see his humanity in that he physically died. He walked through an experience that each of us in this room are also going to experience. It's just he didn't stay in that state. He rose being the God of all glory from the dead and those who have faith in that resurrection will rise again as well. That is good news for us today because death is Satan's greatest weapon. He uses it all the time in our lives to keep us down, to, to have us fearful, to, to keep us from doing what God has called us to do. He will often Put that concept of death in front of us. It's why John 10.10 10 says what? The thief comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. But I have come, Jesus says, so that you may have life and have it in abundance. There is the physical death and then there are shadows of death that we have to deal with. There are some forms of death that Satan even likes to use, some shadows of it. Death is the absence of life. So anxiety is a form of death. Stress is a form of death. Fear is a form of death. Why? Because they are deficient of the Jesus life that he wants us to experience. It's his greatest Weapon And our greatest fear is that life would be choked out and that we wouldn't really live. And it says here in the scripture, so Jesus came and he took on this flesh and blood and he lived perfectly through all the suffering so that he could die and break that power of death in our lives. So when he rose again in this resurrection life, this eternal life that he offers, Romans 8, 11 boldly says that the spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead now lives in you. The power of God, resurrection power, the same power that rose Jesus from the dead now lives in us. You know how uh, movies will have these famous actors and, and we think, man, what, what they have to go through in some of those stunts and in some of those scenes. But, but do you know that they have stand-ins? Like when they're setting up scenes and they're getting the lights just right, and, and, and people are standing out in the rain and, and all of the, the conditions to, to get the movie set up and ready to go. They have stand-ins for the actors. It's not until later on that the big star comes out and actually goes through the scene and delivers the lines. They have these stand-ins. And, and here it's saying that in his humanity, Jesus came and stood in our place 
in death. He took our death upon himself. And when we accept that, live in it, believe it, feed our faith in that. Jesus begins to, to, to deliver us from fear. It's 2 Timothy 1.7, right? God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. So the way for us to move past fear is to move closer to God's love and what God has accomplished for us. I think about um, two men commissioned by Thomas Jefferson back in 1804, Lewis and Clark. They found themselves on the journey of a lifetime. They were going to take out of St. Louis and they were going to leave behind even the East Coast. Did you know that back then uh, two out of every three American citizens lived within 50 miles of the East Coast of the Atlantic Ocean? Isn't that Crazy to think that America back then was largely populated except for the indigenous people and the Native Americans that were across the land. It was largely just right there, 50 miles from the ocean. But they took out to explore unchartered territories. So they left and they took the Missouri River, largely a crew of people who had learned how to sail and navigate and boat. And they were going to travel upstream to the Missouri, hoping to find that place somewhere on a mountaintop where they would cross over and the river would start flowing the other way. And then they could just sail down or, or, or float down to the other large body of ocean. And all along the way, they were going to chart the land. A year into their journey, their hopes were dashed when they climbed the mountain only to find this huge mountain range in front of them. They were near uh, Great Falls, Montana. And they were nearing the Great Divide. They, they crossed over this hill and they saw the Rocky Mountains. Thinking that they were close, they realized, man, how far away we are. Not only that, but these, these sea people, these boat captains, these river people, now they had to become mountain climbers, something that they had never done in their lives. They had to do something with their canoes and their boats and outfit their, themselves some way or the other to get over these mountains. And not only that, it was dead of winter. So here they are facing their hardest year yet. The journey, they thought, would ease, but it just... It just got harder. But at some point, matter of fact, it was 4,162 miles into their journey. They were on a body of water. They had finally crossed over, started making their way down towards the Pacific Ocean. And one morning, the fog lifted with the morning sunrise. And when the fog lifted, they finally saw nothing but water as far as they could see. They were in a bay in Oregon, and the ocean was only miles ahead. And the most famous journal entry from the Lewis and Clark expedition was written that day, and it was these simple words. The journal entry read this, Oh, what joy. Oh, what joy. Hebrews 2.10. In order to bring us glory, God made Jesus a perfect leader through suffering. He is the pioneer of our salvation. He made the way for us to find eternal peace with God. Whatever loneliness, whatever suffering, whatever death we may be experiencing in this life, one day, the fog will lift and we will declare, oh, what joy. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for walking. Thank you for standing in my place. Thank you for making a way to the other side. Let's pray together. Just a couple of questions for you this morning. As you consider 
what God has been teaching us today. Do you lack courage? Just feel frozen in life sitting here this morning. Would you look at the pioneer of our salvation? See Jesus and the way that he has made. Are you lonely today? Would you see Jesus and how he claims you as family today? Are you afraid of death? Would you see the one who has destroyed death, broke the power of fear because Satan's greatest weapon has been vanquished by a risen Savior today? And if you can't see Jesus, would you come this morning? I would love to introduce you to him. We're going to have a time of invitation in just a second. We're going to sing a song of worship and reflection. If you can't see him, you come. Jesus, today you are family. You love us. Pray that just washes over the people in this room, the people that are watching online. We have someone, a brother that sticks closer. Jesus, you suffered for us. You know what suffering is like. That we would draw from your strength even today. Understand the workings of suffering and what it's bringing about even in our lives. Would you increase our faith? Jesus, you are freedom. You broke the chains of death. There is nothing left for us to fear. So help us to get busy living in the freedom that you have paid and brought for us. God, thank you for who you are in our lives. Thank you that we can worship a risen Savior. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen.